So you're all here to learn about um, decolonizing our practice today. And this workshop is going to be led by the lovely Curran, who is um, the Indigenous uh, Education Consultant at New Frontier School Board, um, also a uh, Ganya Kahaga educator. And we're so happy to have her with us today. Um, so happy that you're joining us while you're cooking your dinner, too. Thank you. Just one of those things, you know, becoming domestic and all that good stuff. I gotta, I mean, I just moved, so I have to, I'm like the number one cook. So I'm the person who's got to make sure the food's ready to roll. Um, so yeah, all right. Well, hello gang. Um, my name is Curran. Gaji uh, Turtleguess is my Ganyigaha name. It means um, gathering flowers in the water. And actually my whole life, I always knew my name was Gaji Turtleguess. Um, and I knew that the translation was to gather flowers or to pick flowers. Um, but then I, I took, so I had a, I started my teaching career at the Mohawk Immersion School in Ganawaga. Um, and I, I never, I'm not a speaker. So I've just started to come into my language as an adult. I mean, my father used pieces of it when I was young, right around the house. And so I was familiar with it, but I never went to school. Um, in our community. So the first time that I attended a school in our community was the Mohawk Immersion School as a grade five, six teacher of the English program. And so I was immersed like full hardcore in it. So like I could tell you when recess was indoors or if a kid was asking me to go get water because I started to learn the language just by listening to it. And we had a Ganyageha class that we had to take for the beginners. So there was a few of us who didn't have a strong language background. Um, and one of the, our teacher, he was going through our names with us and he told me that my name actually is specific to picking flowers in the water, which I thought was really interesting. Um, you know, I was like, what kind of flowers do you have in the water? But then when I think about lily pads and like how much I, I kind of have spent my life in the water. My father's a swimmer and him and I, we kind of bonded over our love for swimming laps of all things, but also anywhere in a lake or anywhere I can dive in and feel the fresh, cool water. It's kind of been a part of my life. Um, and so that's kind of just like, you know, a little bit about who I am. Um, I also, I also kind of think of my name as like a metaphor for the things that I do. Um, if we imagine that people are flowers, right. I'm constantly, you know, I'm like a collector of flowers. I'm a collector of people. I just love to meet people and to spend time learning from each other and talking and getting to know everybody. And so in that sense, I think my name kind of holds true for the kind of work that I've engaged in now as a consultant and as an educator. Um, and that's one of the things, that's one of the teachings that comes up with our names in Ganya Kahaga culture is that when you're named, you're supposed to be named at birth, right? And so that name that you're given, it has to do with the season that you were born in and kind of what's going on in the world at the time. Um, and it's a name that's unique to you, but it's also considered your path and like your journey of what you're going to do. Um, and so sometimes it's like, you know, very uh, literal. So I had a little girl in one of my classes at Gertie Nuha, the immersion school, her name meant she's like, she's very loud, which was accurate. Um, I can, I can definitely approve of that one. Um, but then some of them, like my sister's name is Gertrude Hyukewas and it means to clear the skies. But we know she's not actually up there racing all the clouds from us. So we start to think of it in more of a metaphorical way. And I think that's kind of the basis of, for myself, as I started trying to decolonize my own practice, my own mind, my own ways of being, right? I always emphasize to people, I attended school outside of my community. I had some cultural teachings um, and we didn't talk about the effects of colonization as I was growing up. These are only things that started to come to my attention as I you know, started pursuing my education in post-secondary meeting people, realizing, hey, our lives are not the same. I grew up on a reserve. What does that mean? You know, like I had to, I had to understand that the life that I lived was a little bit different than some of the people that I was meeting when I was going to school. And I had to kind of reconcile what that meant for me um, moving forward, right? And so decolonization, I only have had like a really good grasp on what decolonization means, honestly, within the past year. Right, and I've been engaging in work with my culture and my community and supporting indigenous learners. And, you know, I have a lot like doing a lot of cultural teaching, but to understand what it means to decolonize has always been very tricky for me to understand. 
Um, and so that's kind of what I'm going to unpack a little bit with us today is about, you know, understanding decolonization and how we can all start to work on our own decolonizing journeys. Um, because ultimately decolonization starts just with us, right? So it begins with what, what we carry and how we move through the world. And that will, you know, carry into our practice, whether we're teaching or we're consulting or we're working with whoever. Um, and that even goes beyond into the when we're, you know, just occupying spaces in the world and how we're interacting with other people. And also, it also allows us to kind of open our eyes a little bit to the ways in which systems, you know, they don't, they're not, it, it brings us, it, it like opens our eyes to more of the flaws of the systems that we are engaged in, right? Who, where are the inequities? but not so much where are the inequities, but also more, why are those inequities there? And what can we do to start to undo those things, right? Because it's really much, it's really a lot about undoing, I think. Um, all of that is to say, part of my own philosophy of what I work in right now, and then I have a PowerPoint or a something to show you guys some cool visuals and whatever, but uh, you'll, you'll realize that like, if something just comes to me, I'm just gonna tell you, we just kind of roll with it. Um, anytime I do a workshop. As I've been working as a consultant now for the New Frontier School Board, I work with all levels from pre-K all the way up to adult and vocational, which has been a really eye-opening experience for me. Um, and one of the things that I've really realized in meeting all of these Indigenous learners um, that I am, you know, part of my job is to support them and to support the people who support them, both for their social, emotional needs, for their physical well-being, and also you know, for their academic needs, so like the holistic approach. And I also work on curriculum development. So like I hold really big dossiers for what I do. And so, but the, you know, the metaphor and the language that I use to kind of describe those things, I think is a really, a really good representation of where I'm at in my decolonization. And so the term that I, the, the term, the language that I use when I talk about my work is in Ganyageha, the word is zideyohahoga. Okay, zideyo hahoga, and that means between two paths or two roads, depending on who you're talking to. One person in Gunawage will tell you one thing, and her neighbor will tell you a different. Roads, paths, does they're simultaneous? They're they're the same in this context. Um, and so this concept of being between two paths, when I'm thinking about indigenous learners, is this idea that our like indigenous people are coming up in a world where we're being asked to occupy two spaces simultaneously. We have to walk with a foot in our own cultural worlds and be able to stand up and be proud of who we are as indigenous peoples and whatever nation we come from. But we also have to compromise that sometimes by also being able to be successful in academic spaces and in Western spaces, you know, walking this fine line between what education can look like in an indigenous perspective and being good at that while also being good at education in the mainstream sense. And so we're, there's this constant sort of, you know, negotiation that goes on within Indigenous people to be able to navigate these two paths. And so I kind of describe it as people as being between the two paths, right? And our goal as educators, whether we're working strictly in academics, which is never the case, <laughs> you know, we're all humans and we end up having to talk to each other and get to know each other. But the goal is really to support learners, particularly Indigenous learners, but I really think all learners, to be able to walk with the foot firmly in each path that they have to walk. Now, I also like to use this metaphor when I'm thinking about, you know, what, what people, non-Indigenous educators who are teaching. And this idea, right, and it's gonna come up in, in different ways when I, you know, talk about different nations perspectives of this, but I think it's an approach that we need to think about it also, right, is that as we're educating and we're looking at our curriculum, we need to think about that we are also between two paths as well. We have this, you know, mainstream curriculum that we're being expected to teach. And we know that those are the educational goals that our students need to hit. But we also need to be mindful of the needs of some of our learners and that alternate perspectives of some of these concepts are important for us to also include, right? When we have students, we want buy-in of what they're learning. And if they can see themselves in what they're learning, then they're gonna be able to absorb it more and then also to produce and to practice and to do all the things that we expect of them in an academic setting. And so 
educators are also being asked to kind of walk two paths of being able to negotiate how do I integrate two or three or four different kinds of perspectives? And it doesn't have to be all the time, because let's be real, we need to teach students to pass math and to be able to weld straight lines and to be able to analyze literature. But it's about some of the small integrative things that we can do. So that's kind of you know my metaphor that I've come up with for decolonization. Now that stems from some cultural teachings that I have gotten over the years from elders and from listening to other people talk about these things, right? This is everything that I'm gonna talk about today is not a new concept, right? And these are not things that I, like I am using Di Deo Ha Hoga as my framework for the way that I understand these concepts of decolonization, reconciliation, student support, indigenization, all of the words we're gonna talk about today. And that's how I kind of frame the ways in which I move through educational spaces. But these concepts and these understandings, they go even deeper than that, right? So like everything that I talk about and that I share with people is things that I have learned, right? It's like I'm forever writing this long essay where I'm constantly citing my sources because I can't lay claim to that knowledge, but all I can do is share it with people as we move through. And that's a very indigenous practice, this consistently sharing knowledge so that it doesn't die out. And so we make sure that people are getting the message. I always go back when I'm talking, starting with decolonization, right? And we start having these conversations around it. And I go back to teachings from our culture, the Ohonthe Gardi Wadekwa. So I remember when I say ours, I mean specifically Ganyet Gahaga or Haudenosaunee, the Six Nations, right? It's because that's the Confederacy that we belong to. Um, and the Ohontagardu Adekwa, it's words that we say we pass before all else. But our elder, Tom Porter, he actually says that the words, the Ohontagardu Adekwa are things that we pass before we do something important. And I, it's, you know, for me, this is one of my, one of the things that I worked very hard on learning was the Ohontagardu Adekwa. And the basis of it is that in Ganyageha, in our language, you give thanks for everything from the ground in the natural world all the way up to the sky. So we give things thanks for things like Godesu'a, which is the fish, Gandario, uh, the animals, the bugs, the stars, uh, the grasses, and then the creator. And then the very last thing that we say to people is that if I have not given thanks for something that you think is important, now's your chance to kind of say it for yourself. And ultimately, it's this really important way of bringing our minds together for whatever kind of, you know, work that we're going to be engaging in, or if we're sitting in a presentation, it's for us to think together. Um, and that's which is to have a good mind, right? We want everybody to be on the same track to have a good mind. Now, these connections to the natural world and those original teachings, the Thanksgiving address, our elder Tom Porter he says, and I'm just going to read his quote. I, I wrote it from him because I think it's really powerful. And this is in his book that he wrote. And by wrote, I mean he spoke and someone wrote it down for him. Um, but he says, that is the Reader's Digest form of the spiritual key of the ceremonial world of the Iroquois, the Mohawk and the Oneida, the Onondaga, the Cayuga and the Seneca and the Tuscarora. And I would even dare say to further than that, of all the nations of North America and South America, and if you want to take a step back a couple thousand years, it's probably the same words that the Irish had at one time. Africa has some of it yet, and all the world's people used to have it. They call it the universal truth, and that's what we have to get back to. So when we think about, right, pre-call, before colonization, these concepts of universal human truth and connection to the natural world, that it, it has been the movement away from those original teachings that all people across all of the world have had, he says that those are the things that we need to reconnect back to. So I'm gonna let him talk for a second and this gives me a chance to get my garlic bread out of the oven. What I see is to reconnect with Mother Earth, who is our mother and would never sell us down the river. Reconnect with the old brother's son. He's the one that's the most reliable that never abandoned us. Reconnect with Grandfather Thunder, for they're the one that renews all the water that we drink every day. Reconnect with the trees, maple tree, that brings sweetener to our life, fruits, nourishment, 
shade in a hot summer's day, warmth from the fire in a cold winter. There are friends, the moose and the deers and the fish. Those are the truths that we need to ally with. Because if we don't, our children won't have a chance. Our great-grandchildren won't even get born. So that's what my recommendation is for all people, not just natives, but all people in the world, to reconnect to the real truths of the universe and respect it and to love them. That's how we break loose, not to listen to those manipulators and those man-made organizations that just use and use and abuse and they don't care. That's what people's got to wake up. And we can wake up because the sun is still shining. That's the one that gives us the light to see. And if we choose to keep our eyes closed, you can hit that mountain, solid rock mountain, you break your head open. If you want to be dumb and keep your eyes closed when you're traveling, and open your eyes so the light of the sun can show you what's there. That's what I recommend. And that's why all the native indigenous ceremonies is connected to all of those. That's what missionaries destroyed. That's what kings and queens destroyed, dynasties, because that was our power. They gave us the power to live with the Mother Earth and ourselves. The whole world needs that now. So, you know, his words that he passes, I mean, my father, like, this is a man that we've, I've been listening to my whole life. Um, I've actually gone to have breakfast with the man, my dad's friends with him, but like, you know, Indian country is small. Um, but, you know, he's speaking so much about like the things that he's referring to, you know, he connects it back to the natural world. And of course, when we think about, you know, especially where we're headed in terms of like the climate crisis and how much, you know, as a human society, that caring for the land is not really there. You know, that's the bigger picture of what people need to wake up to. But I think that what the, the connections go far beyond that because culturally for us, everything about our way of life was, was tied to the land, everything. I did a workshop today with uh, some grade 10 students where we talked about indigenous dance, okay? And um, I'll come back here for a second because now it's a story moment. Um, but I, as I was doing some research, right, I was like, okay, guys, listen, I'm no pro. Like, I know everyone thinks of powwow dancing, but I'm like, hey, to break it to you, that's not a Mohawk thing. So I'm going to teach you about what we do in terms of our culture. Uh, and like the, the one, the very first dance, we have a social dance. Okay, so socials are like an opportunity for people to dance together like you think about like you know when you're in like the 90s and you're going to the school dance and like you have fun and everybody laughs and you're hanging out okay well socials we've been doing that like since the beginning of time but it was really our social songs that we would go right it's an opportunity to blow off steam to do those things and the very first dance that we do now is called Gadatra or standing quiver dance and I'll be honest I just learned what a quiver was for the first time while I was doing research for this I had no idea the little thing that you carry your, your arrows in is a quiver. Yeah, the people who are nodding, I'm like, yeah, I showed up late to the party, didn't know what a quiver was, okay? Now it makes so much more sense to me. But as I was learning about that, the dance, it was originally a dance where the, the main leader of whatever, you know, whether it was the clan village or the whole, the nation, when he was gonna get ready to gather his men together to go to war, he would start, he would call out into the village. He would yell like a, like a call three times and the men knew to come out now and they would stack their quivers up together so that this is the standing quiver. They're putting it on the side because that's the call for them to be going now. And he would start the dance within the village and the men would follow and the women would come in and it was an opportunity for them to prepare to know that their call is happening now to go out, you know, to have to go to battle, to war. And so I was, I'm like, wow, like that's really, you know, it's like even our dances now that people do, like the, the, the meaning is in there 
And we continue to still do these things because it had a purpose from before. Everything had a purpose. Um, even like the women's dances, the women's dance that we do at social, the movement of the women's feet, it's a shuffle. And it, it mimics when you're planting and you put your seeds in and how you're patting down, you know, the, the, the soil around where you've planted in your garden. It's, you know, there's a connection to all of those things. And so like everything that we do is embedded in that. And so I think he's kind of saying that humans as a whole need to start to do that. But I think that that, like that connection comes down to now we need to think about what is decolonizing? What is it going back to being humans, right? Not just connection to the land, but what does it mean to be people with people and existing to support each other and to support the natural world? And a lot of what that looked like when you know we aren't able to imagine what that looks like because colonialism happened in many spaces where there was a priority that was put in place over whose knowledge was more valuable than others and there's this really really good ted talk by this young woman her name's katsala carson she's a singer she's an artist and she unpacks colonialism as a term and I, I have to read this specific paragraph to you because it's such a powerful way to kind of understand where we start with decolonization right and so she says colonialism which is things we're going to be familiar with but way she words it is very powerful so colonialism is another country or nation state coming to a territory with the purpose of taking the resources of that territory and appropriating them and that happens when they come to these territories is that they also bring their axiology, which is a big word for how we quantify, how we give value, how we prescribe worth to things. So when colonizers came upon contact, they decided that this is the worth of the people and this is the worth of the resources and this is the worth of the land and this is what we can pursue here. And so that becomes embedded in all institutions that create the nation state afterwards. So when we get to post-colonial, which I've had some interesting conversations with some English teachers about whether we're really living in a post-colonial situation at the moment, right? All of our institutions, all our policies, all our government structures are based off of those beliefs that were brought to with contact. And so the most difficult thing for people to unpack when they're thinking about what decolonization looks like in terms of their own lives Right, And that one of the conversations that it's really difficult to have with teachers sometimes is that some of the values that you're carrying that have been learned that come from the systems that you're a part of, those are not necessarily values that are going to benefit students in the classes that you're with. What you think is right and what is comfortable for you is uncomfortable for someone else. And so when we start to decolonize, it's a very uncomfortable situation to be in because we're being asked to see things through a different lens and to not necessarily devalue our own perspectives and our own ways of being, knowing and seeing, but to consider someone else's and allow space for there to be equal footing. And it's very challenging when you are you know, working in a system where things have always been a certain way. And then someone says, yeah, but that's not the only way that it has to be. And I find that the challenge sometimes that I've had with teachers, not just when it comes to teaching content, but also the ways in which they're dealing with students within their classrooms, is that what they believe for certain students is what is the right thing for that kid can actually be causing more damage and harm to those kids because culturally or mentally and emotionally where they're at, it, their value system doesn't quite match that of what this teacher in the mainstream system has. So it's a very, you know, it's a very, it's murky water to kind of go through because even indigenous people are in this point where they have to look at, we have to look at where have we been colonized? What are we seeing? And how, what does, what is that, what is that compromise for us as indigenous people? So non-indigenous people have to go through the process of decolonization and indigenous people are doing it at the same time. And so we're like, yo, we don't have all the answers either. Don't worry but also we can kind of figure it out together as we go along. And I think I always focus primarily on decolonization before I get to reconciliation. And to me, it's a very important kind of point to, to differentiate is that decolonization is really about pulling back the systems, pulling back the norms and, the, and what we value and kind of refocusing on other things. 
And then reconciliation is about how we're gonna to work together with people to, in order to see those changes come to light. And so I, I, from my own stance, I don't think you can start reconciliation until you've started decolonizing yourself first and then the, the places that you're working in and your classrooms. It's a lot, it's a lot, I know. <laughs> and, and I'm doing it at the same time and it's, you know, it's a real, it's been a real challenge. Um, I like this story this idea of, of two different pots. And I mean, I kind of really articulated, I think clearly this concept of colonization, but um, I, I sit in this group, it's a Haudenosaunee educators group. And um, the, the group, we have different guest speakers who come in, it's people from across the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. So I get an opportunity to talk with other educators, whether they're on or off reserve and the kind of challenges that we're facing. And one of the presenters we had, his name is Jamie Jacobs, and he's uh, a curator for the Rochester Museum. So he's in Seneca territory. And he was talking about some of the artifacts that they have. And so when he was talking about clay pots, right? When we look at you know the differences between a clay pot versus let's say a steel pot that's that colonizers brought with them we can see many benefits as to why you know this pot is progressive and much and much better valued you don't have to keep remaking it it'll last you know it's not going to break as easily um if you're staying in one place and you're not moving around anymore then it makes sense to just have your one pot and you're good to go right like we're not continuously going to be making pots at our house. Actually, I was thinking about that today. I have to wash dishes. And I was like, man, sometimes I wish I could just use paper plates all the time, but that's not sustainable, right? So, so the alternatives to using a clay pot over a steel pot make so much sense. But when you start to actually observe and think about this clay pot and the process that was put into it and the cultural significance of it and even the designs in it, right? If we eliminate clay pots from a community or a culture. We're not just eliminating the physical object, but we're actually eliminating an entire cultural process that existed. So for women, right, it was the women who made the pots and the older women, the grandmothers would teach their daughters and they would teach the younger girls how to make them. And so there was this, you know, this intergenerational knowledge sharing that was happening. And so at the same time, it was important for women to be able to, not just women, but women were the ones that, that historically we say were the ones who made them. But important knowledge for them was also every 15 to 20 years, Haudenosaunee villages would move because we were agriculturalists, right? So we had to go where the resources were because our soil would no longer be fertile anymore. But also we would run out of firewood because we would have used the area around us and we would have depleted our resources of clay. And so our community, the whole would pick up and move somewhere else and go down for another 15, 20 years. And the, the two things that the people had to learn to look for for a good spot, aside from the land, which they could fertilize, was where the clay was and where the fire was. And so this was knowledge that was passed down also, things you had to look for. And so even if there's designs that are put into these clay pots, Designs in Haudenosaunee culture is a way of communication. And so the types of designs that you're putting in are communicating certain, certain aspects of who you are, what clan you're from, the cultural elements that are implemented in that. And so this is a really complex sort of cultural, you know, teachings and knowledge that takes place all in the creation of this pot. And so the effects of colonization in this instance was we don't really care about all this cultural stuff. We don't know anything about what you guys do. We just have a better version of this. And I think you guys would benefit from it. And so, and I, and I believe that our people were like, man, if these people are saying that this is a good thing, we're going to take it. And they themselves didn't even realize the loss of what the culture was. So I don't even think that colonizers coming in and doing this were necessarily at first trying to abolish indigenous knowledge. But I think that the process of meeting and not having this culture sharing and this knowledge sharing inevitably created spaces where certain materials, knowledges, ways of being was now pushed aside and the revaluing of the new things with the new world was what the priority was. And so this whole where, where indigenous people are trying to learn to decolonize is about bringing back the learning of how to make these clay pots to re 
to reinstate the cultural knowledge and the connection that was created in that way. But we still go buy our pots from Canadian Tire just like everybody else. And there's a really good set that's on sale right now. So I recommend that if you need new pots that you go and do that. So I've been talking for a long time and like I have lots of things I can talk about, but I'm just going to, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm kind of going to wrap up what my major points are from this decolonization um, part is. And then I have lots of resources that I can share, but I think I'm more interested in just hearing where different people are at in terms of their understanding of decolonization and also where you think you're at in terms of where you're working in the schools that you're in. You know, like, is there a way forward? What are we looking for? Because one of the things that Tom Porter, that he kind of is, you know, he's what the message that's coming up is something that's part of our Haudenosaunee philosophy and lots of indigenous people also, right? This forward thinking, the seven generations philosophy. Everything that you're doing is for the seven generations ahead. And so any kind of changes that we make today in any form of decolonizing or progression or our education system, it's gonna benefit the kids that are seven generations from now. Right, because the world that we have today, we've inherited from the seven generations behind us. And if the, for the people to have this forward thinking, that means that they're thinking about what kind of world are they gonna leave behind? And I read a really, you know, when I was out in BC um, on, on a trip hiking one time, I saw a really good sign and it said, we didn't, it actually the language and we talk about where we're inheriting things from, right? But it says that we don't actually inherit the land. We are borrowing the land from our future generations because what's gonna be here when we're done is what's gonna be there when the kids get there. And so it's really powerful to kind of think of it in that way. And so the decisions that we make as educators when we're teaching our courses, right? I have a lot of, I, I go to student um, classes with student teachers and a lot of what they say is I'm really afraid to teach this. I don't feel like I know enough information. It's not my culture. I don't think that it's something that I that I should be doing, right? All of like the, the telltale signs of being nervous and unsure about what you're doing. And that's normal. But then they also give the same kind of sentiments where they say, well, how come I never learned this before? Why am I only learning this now? And say, okay, that's that's the question that we need to go with. Why are you only learning this now? And there's two reasons for that. The first one is that people were not aware of it. We didn't talk about these things, right? I only learned about residential schools as an indigenous person when I started Sage Up. So even at 19 years old, I had lived 19 years in my community. There were people who were living there who were residential school survivors. My mother herself went to day school, which is a whole other thing that we still didn't, didn't really talk about until now, but it wasn't a conversation. And so I didn't learn those things. But now in our communities, we're emphasizing that we need our kids to be able to learn that history, right? We tell the story so that the stories continue on. And so I tell them, you ask why you never learned this. So why are you gonna deny your students teaching them different perspectives? Because if you don't make that change now, then they're gonna be asking the same questions, right? The seven generations mentality. And so, that's kind of, you know, the goal is that we want to start to share indigenous perspectives in our teaching, in our curriculum. And it's a lot easier than you think because people are pumping out resources left, right and center, easy teacher, teacher ready things, you know, like, and, and even more so, we wanna normalize integrating indigenous people into what we're teaching. So, I had a teacher from one of our adult centers ask me for short stories by indigenous people, but with resources. And I was like, well, there's no particular resources that are created, but I sent him three really good short stories. And I said, I want you to analyze these stories with the students in the same way that you would analyze every other story. Because if you look at the context of what the people are writing about, especially in short stories, novels can be a little bit more specific to indigenous, to like, you know, very like, social justice kind of topics. But these short stories were really just about the daily lives of indigenous peoples. And so I said, we need to normalize that. We need to be able to have discussions around what these people are doing, what, what is their motivation. And if we supplement that with looking at, you know, the history 
then people have that background to say, hey, maybe this is why this person went there. We're connecting cross-curricularly. And then the beauty, right, and the ultimate for me, decolonization, what does it mean? To be able to walk two paths, or as the Mi'kmaq say, you know, two-eyed seeing, being able to look at something and see two perspectives of it simultaneously. Science is the number one subject that we can see this happening all the time. Because science is ultimately, there is, you know, Western science and the way that the empirical science has been developed that, that explains all of these concepts. And Indigenous people were explaining these concepts in their own ways before, and they live simultaneously and they're both right. And one of the beautiful things that I have learned a lot, particularly in, in the um, field of medicine, my parents, they run the traditional medicine unit in our community. And the name for their, for their program, it translates to two medicines working side by side. And so it's this emphasis that it's not one or the other, right? That seems to be what people think all the time. Well, you have to only use one type of medicine, screw Western medicine. No, it's about being able to have them work together to reconcile that they can exist and support people together. And it's been really beautiful to see my parents kind of work through that. My mom is a nurse. And so she's like, do not stop taking your medication for cancer. Do not stop going to your treatments. You need those things. That's what's going to help you. But we have maybe this tea that you can drink that can help to calm your nerves when you have to go into those things. And maybe we can work on some spirit work and some meditations to be able to support you while you're going through those things and to be able to learn about the understandings of from culturally what's going on with you. And it's possible to have both of those together. And so the depth with which we cover culture, not Indigenous people, non-Indigenous people can't get that deep. But we can present to people and to our students that there are multiple ways of seeing the same thing. And that's ultimately what we need to do to decolonize our teaching and our practice. Okay, I said a lot of things and I saw a lot of nods. I see some people smiling, which is a good thing. So I'm not leaving now until people talk to me or tell me something about their lives, tell us a story. This is our chance now to kind of spend some time together. Uh, my name is Wayne. Um, I'm a teacher at the uh, English Montreal School Board in uh, the healthcare sector. Um, I've worked uh, about 30 odd years in healthcare and most of that time with kids. Um, and the last uh, 10 years or so that I worked in the hospital was in psychiatry at the Montreal Children's. And uh, one of the things that I, um, my, my career, I've been, I've been a nurse, I've been an educator. Um, I'm much into understanding uh, psychosocial uh, relationships and um, how we develop from our youth into adults. Um, and it was very interesting, a lot of what you were saying about um, how <clears throat> How colonization has affected, um, you know, well, what it is today that most Native people would call culture, uh, what they can remember of what their their ancestors told them. Is that that was very interesting to me. Also, um, I've been working a lot for a very long time on understanding how individuals perceive their environment, um, and a lot of the things that you were mentioning before. Um, I kind of use the um, the analogy you use axi axiology. I think that's what you called it. Axiology. Mm. Yeah. Um, when if I was to relate it to, to healthcare, sorry, sorry to keep you guys. I don't. I'm oh, sorry. Shorten what I'm saying here. When we talk about, for instance, if you see somebody on the street there, they appear to be unconscious or something. If any of you have taken a first aid course, you know you you see if they're oriented. So uh, do you know your name? You know that sort of thing. Um, I've found those things to be very important and I included the four. So uh, self, how you perceive yourself, how you perceive others, how you perceive your space, and how you perceive your time. Um, and if we have two different individuals speaking, uh, and if, if I can use the example that we have here with you working with us, if you're a native person uh, and a person of perhaps European descent, how one sees themselves is not necessarily how the other sees themselves. And typically because of our nature as human beings, 
depending on or how uh, humble we are, we may think that how we see ourselves is how the other person should see us ourselves. <laughs> also, how we see our other, we also may believe that they should feel about themselves the way that we see them. So this, these, these dynamics create very huge um, problems. Uh, if, if you're not able to understand and humble yourself properly, to accept the fact that someone else has what I call basic, what I call them the functioning orientation of your, of your belief systems. I think each one of those is a belief system. And I also call them functioning orientation of your bullshit because <laughs> that's what a belief system is. What you think about yourself isn't necessarily true. It's based on you know what you were conditioned to believe. And so if you were a little bit flexible, you probably would learn something <laughs> in any one of those things. So anyway, all that to say, thank you very much for this opportunity because it's nice to hear uh, um, that, that side of it. And um, uh, myself, I'm coming from the African-American community and I see also a lot of, of um, a lot of similarity with what's happening now in the States with this whole critical race theory business and how they're trying to stop everything that has to do with telling history as it actually is. Um, I haven't heard anything in what you talked about to make it seem as though your culture is better than or more important than any other. It's just about really making sure that people are aware of the facts so that the children who absorb this, the actual truth of what we uh, of experience as a people, all of us, you know, collectively, they can learn from it properly, instead of you know, perpetuating the same bullshit that we are living these days. And thank you guys for letting me talk for so long. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, thank you. And and you know, like, so I talk when I talk about decolonization, I talk, you know, from my background, my community, my cultural perspective. But decolonization, right, we have to be mindful about how colonialism has affected all corners of the world. There's lots of different countries and spaces that are still dealing with actual direct colonialism right now, right? This, and that's why I, I, the question that I ask people all the time is, are we really post-colonial? Because when we start to think about, you know, our systems that are in place, there's still, there's still inequities for lots of, you know, people of color um, and that part of decolonizing is being mindful of those things as well. Um, and actually, so, but I, I'm kind of, I'm glad that you spoke, Wayne, because, you know, I am, you know, my work is about supporting people to integrate Indigenous perspectives into their teaching. Um, but when I started thinking about this and I was working on writing my thesis, which I, if anybody is thinking about doing it, just be prepared, it's very isolating and long. You do it and it's done, but man, what an experience. So when I was doing that though, um, my supervisor brought me to learn about the, the theory of the funds of knowledge. And that was the basis that I used to describe um, supporting indigenous learners. So my, my thesis was about how uh, non-indigenous schools uh, or what, how, what students attending non-indigenous schools from Ganawage, what supported them to be successful and how can we learn from that to implement that into our schools? Um, oh, thanks, Emily. <laughs> um, she just put my thesis down there. Yeah, you can read it anytime you want. <laughs> um, but the funds of knowledge theory is really about, it's really open so that all students, when you're going into a classroom, right, you're creating learning situations where all students from no matter their background, their culture, their communities, where they're coming from, the, the types of various kinds of families that they're from, that they can find a way to come in to what they're learning. Right. And so in in the, the design fiction that I created, because I'm a nerd and I wrote a short story as part of my um, findings for my thesis was, you know, examples of students navigating a school. And one of the things was like, you know, we're working on letter writing within our English class. And one of the girls, she talks about how, you know, they're saying, OK, well, what are some kinds of spaces that you think that, you know, you really want someone to hear your voices? And so I imagined a girl, you know, her says her little brother, he's on a hockey team and they get, you know, there's racism against them. And so I said, okay, so now we're going to write a letter to that hockey association. What would you write? And so they're, you know, fulfilling their academic needs, but also it's relevant to them because they can physically take that letter once they're done and sent it out. Right. And so as I was doing research around funds of knowledge, one of the examples that they give in the research you know, as this teacher who does a whole unit in grade five, six around nutrition. And what he does is he sends kids home to look at what they're eating in their houses. 
and you know and they come back to talk about it and so everybody eats and so they're giving an opportunity to kind of reflect on their own culture and we're not following the Canada food guide and saying here's all of the you know the things you need to eat but really it's observing okay like you know what kinds of proteins and carbs where are your sources from and being able to unpack those things but from a culturally relevant perspective and so the funds of knowledge is a really beautiful way to be able to design lessons that allow all people from different cultures to be able to buy in. And by default, you're also integrating indigenous perspectives because now you're asking indigenous learners in your classes to be able to bring parts of their identity into what they're doing, right? And so it's like, it's like a trick. We're like tricking people into doing cultural learning. And, and the, the beauty of it is that we're not just talking about like traditional culture. There are a lot of indigenous students in our schools, in our board, they have no sense of their traditional identity. They know that they're Mohawk, they know they're from their community, but they have no connection to language and to those things. So we can't, you know, so even for them, they're learning some of these things for the first time and we're talking about it in our classrooms. And having them, you know, integrate things from their own cultural background might be things from what their family does. What does Christmas look like? You know, what kind of holidays do you have? Um, if you plant, what kind of things do you plant in your garden? Oh, is that relevant to your culture? Like, you know, like there's, you, we have to be mindful that not everybody's coming from those spaces. So the funds of knowledge is a, is a way to kind of tread lightly and be able to open the doors more broadly to be able to bring people into what we're teaching. Um, and so, yeah, we need to do more of that. And yeah, because all people, a lot of people are not seeing themselves in what they're learning as well, right? Because we have all of our intersections and our diversity in terms of our identities. So, and decolonizing is a part of that too, making space for those ways of being. I know I said I wasn't going to talk more, but I'm ready for whoever else is ready to hit us with their thoughts. Yeah. Um, and I really, really appreciate this, this, uh, this, this sharing. Um, but one thing I also jumps to my eye that I also felt through class in my classes also when I uh, taught science and math is that representation, visual representation. It was such an important thing. So just to add to what you just said, sometimes it's nice to connect is to see yourself, to get inspired, to say, oh my God, look what this person did. I could do that too. Sometimes they need that visual kind of support. Mm -hmm. So thank you, yeah. And I just I just did um, a workshop for our board the other day about indigenous role models. <laughs> and, but really what I wasn't, what I was trying to get people to think about is like that, exactly. like how are we what who are we showing when we're talking about people in the fields that we're teaching in and how can we integrate you know other like for students to see themselves and uh in our welding programs in our board um I really try to emphasize we have a lot of students from Kahnawake who go to the welding programs because they want to be iron workers and I'm like so why don't we get iron workers to come in and to talk about their experience of moving to New York or Detroit you know to work and, and I mean, and they do it, right? So it's not new for them, but those are the kinds of things that are really simple, right? That representation. I already uh, plugged it in the chat, but we had um, a super great session with Dr. Lisa Taylor last month um, and the recording is available. The resources are there. Um, and these, both of these conversations tie super well together. So I highly encourage you to, to check that out. Well, I'm not surprised by that either because LT and I, we work together. That's actually Lisa's classes are the ones that I spend most of my time in. Um, and I'll, and that's, that's a little story for you again, because I just can't be stopped. Um, when I was a student, an undergraduate student because doing my teaching degree, uh, Lisa Taylor, I was in her class and it was a young adult lit class. And it was really interesting. We talk about indigenous authors, whatever. And then she started showing these, like, you know, these excerpts from the, one of the Oka crisis films. And then I was like, she, without context. And I, and I, later on, I understood what she was trying to do, right? She was trying to get people to understand like the actual harsh, like reality of history. But I just didn't think it was done in an appropriate way for people who were saying, I've never learned this before. I don't think that it was supported enough, um, but I didn't have the right words to say that. So I just kind of emailed her and said, hey, I don't think what you did was good. <laughs> But I said it in a way that I was like, you know, I'm just worried about what 
the other students in my class are perceiving of my community. And she said, okay, let's talk. And she said, thank you for telling me that because she wasn't, she was just starting to come into, you know, teaching these concepts and these, these ideas. And she, you know, she, she wanted to hear what I had to say. And she said, you know what, then we're going to co-teach this together and we're going to plan together. And so ever since that year, I've, as a student, as a teacher, as a student in the school, I, you know, TA'd those courses. And then she still ropes me back in to talk to her classes. Um, and it's actually been really interesting for me to kind of spend time learning alongside my peers. And then also now with experience being in the education system and coming back to talking to student teachers, um, it's been really powerful. And she has come so far in the, the thinking that she does with, with respect to teaching decolonized education. And so, you know, I'm not gonna say that I'm the reason, <laughs> but I always encourage people to, if you see something that's, you know, that doesn't sit right with you, like say something because that's Katala Carson, you know, she does this thing where in her, in her TED talk and she talks about like, you know, call out culture versus call in culture. And that was an opportunity where I called her in, right? If we have students sometimes who freak out in classes because, oh my God, this is not cool. This, what you're doing is bad, right? But if we are, if we are starting to model and practice calling in and being able to converse with each other and to be able to learn from those conversations, then that's how real change happens. And so I didn't have the language to describe that at the time, but now thanks to Kitsala, that's what I did is I called in Lisa Taylor and I said, listen, we need to talk about this because I think that there's changes to be made. And so now that's kind of the way that I navigate, you know, educational spaces. And when I'm working with teachers and, you know, directors and support staff and whoever is, I say, hey, listen, let's reflect a little bit on what happened and how can we kind of move forward? So there's just, there's a time for calling out people but it's a little bit easier to call them in and to kind of like let the conversation just be on its own. All right, so we have any last thoughts? Is anybody, you're not sure about something? I didn't, you know, I didn't talk about specific words except for decolonization, but I said a lot of words. Is there something that like you have a burning question about? Now is a good time. Hi. Hi. <laughs> okay, I actually had you in the car now. I was done cooking, but I just, um, <laughs> If I, if I understood correctly, so you were talking about, let me turn this, um, showing the movie on the Oka crisis. So mm -hmm. like, I actually have that for in June. I'm a support staff, like I'm a special ed tech. Um, I'll give you a bit of background. My, my two adult children are Mohawk from Gunawage. Cool. Um, I followed my son on the powwow trail and trying to learn about his culture with him. I try to bring indigenous culture into our school for our indigenous students. Awesome. So one of the things is we show, um, we were children, we do a powwow, we do uh, the orange shirt day. Um, like we have a lot of activities. I bring in indigenous um, people to also run different activities, but I was gonna show the Oka crisis, the documentary uh, this year also. Now, would that be okay? Or should I maybe at the end of it? Okay. So I don't have to have any kind of supports. Oh, okay, okay. Like I, I, she very specifically just like went to small sections of it, and yeah, I was like, we, it's like we need the whole story or okay. not the whole story. Yeah, yeah, no, okay. I think those documentaries are really, really good. Oh, it's amazing. I actually had a friend of mine from Ganawage staying with me during the Oka crisis too. So we saw like the army tanks uh, on La Salle Boulevard, like you know. All, all of that, so. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that I was doing it properly. Yeah, no, that's, it's it's perfect. And also um, there's actually a, so Tracy Deer, who's a director from our community, yeah. she put out the movie Beans. And I, that, yeah, I wanna get that too. Cause that, I mean, as like the Oka crisis documentaries are good because it's, you know, it's from, it's documentary style, right? It's from real time when things were happening. Um, yeah, and but per, but beans is really powerful because it's from the, the like a young person's perspective of what was going on, and it's okay. a really good dramatization of the of what happened during the Oka crisis. Okay, perfect. So maybe if yeah. I show like at different months, like maybe I could do the two hundred seventy years resistance, uh, the Oka crisis, then another month show beans and like try to kind of space yeah. it out so there's like awareness all the time. Yeah, I think that would be okay. cool, right? Because again, those are the 
those are the stories that we need to continue to share because again, right, as we're seeing different environmental crises happening, it's yeah. the same kinds of stories happening over and over again. The rocks at Whiskey Trench one is good, Emily. That one is, is really good because it's specific to Kahnawake. I, I what kind is of, it called? The rocks at Whiskey Trench. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Because yeah. there's like, there's so Alana Sabomswin, she has uh, four documentaries. She has uh, the 270 Years of Resistance. There's Acts of Defiance. 270 Years of Resistance is really good when you're talking about Gunasadage and the origins of the Oka crisis. Um, yeah. And actually, here's something that I, I'm going to kind of put into your minds as we come to a close now. When we think about the language that we're using to describe the what happened, the Oka crisis, think about the word crisis, right? It's the implication that Oka, the community of Oka was in crisis. But mm -hmm. at the time, what really are we talking about? And this is something that I started to think about, especially when we're thinking about like our history curriculum, the language with which we use, whose perspective are we talking about when we're using that language? And how can we decolonize that by changing the ways we describe situations within history? So I still use the Oka crisis because that's how we talk about it. Yeah. But it makes you start to think a little bit, right? Like whose side are we, yeah, whose side are we talking about when we're referring to the crisis? Um, okay. In our community, my like kids, I was born in the middle of 1990, right? In the, in the middle of the crisis. And people here, they say, they call me a blockade baby because that was when the blockades were. Oh yeah. So, so you can see the shift in language, right? Okay. Yeah. But yeah, Thank that's you. awesome. You're welcome. Yo, <laughs> Yo. I see in your hand there, Andy. Yeah. I think that aged you uh, a little bit. It happened uh, 31, 32 years ago. You my first it. year of university, you know, it, it pretty much <laughs> shaped my perspective, uh, yeah. my, my first year of undergrad, and uh, it shaped my perspective for, well, and forever, right? And Emily and I have both worked in on a, on a reserve, in a school on a reserve in northern Quebec, and, you know, we, we carry the that summer the, the news media mm -hmm. images in our, they're etched in our minds, and, you know, as far as uh, decolonization goes, you know, I want to like I really appreciate having that word now in in my uh, vocabulary. I think I think I was, you know, I was in my personal process all the time. But um, it's great that you brought in that that word for me. Uh, I definitely want to use it. And you know, uh, coming back to uh, to uh, <clears throat> in my current role with the Kipchuk, you know, I, I think I'm, I've come a little bit full circle. You know, maybe towards the end of my my career in in education now. Uh, you know, coming back to this really important uh, topic and uh, uh, look forward to working with all you guys and, and hearing, uh, hearing, you know, how we can take this a little, another step further, right? So that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Cool, yeah, thank you. Is thank that you what so I much, created? Karen. Yes, this is the site you created. Right, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. So tons and tons of resources um, for people to explore there. There's teaching resources. They're sort of like history focused because this is this site was made to share some resources that Curran and uh, a whole team had created for some uh, local history courses. But there's also books. Um, there's video resources, podcast suggestions. So tons of stuff to take a look at there. Um, I'm going to share one last thing too. Um, it's so I did a workshop like this for LCEQ um, and in it I created like a box like a toolkit box um, and so I'm just going to share that link it's on Google Drive literally use anything in it use it all if you want I kind of created it as like an administrator's toolkit but there's lots of stuff in there that can be supportive um, you know if you're working on decolonizing within your centers and whatever wherever else you go there's some good stuff there. Um, in answer to your question, Christina, can you email us all the links? Once the recording for this is posted, they will all be available on the Apricot website um, under Anglophone Community. So our lovely Hushar, um, he posts the recording there. He posts all the resources that were shared in the chat. They can all be found um, on the Apricot website, which I emailed to everyone to get the link. So you can just check back there in like 
two weeks, a month, Trisha? Two weeks. <laughs> He's pretty fast. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. And we hope to see you. Our next Apricot is on the topic. Matthew, do you want to pitch it? Yes, it's on April 13th at yeah. 415. Mm -hmm. um, that's a that's a Wednesday. Um, it's on trauma-informed pedagogy. The guest speaker is uh, Roger uh, Rampersad, who is a uh, director from PAC Adult Center, who's currently on sabbatical, um, but it has attended many conferences and is doing um, research in trauma-informed pedagogy in the context of adult education. So come check that one out. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Karen. You can all go and enjoy your dinner now, everybody. Karen, you can eat your garlic bread. Finally. Yes, finally. Thank you. Nice to meet you all, and I hope to see you soon.